Vital bleaching is an integral part of what I do every day in my practice. Uh, and I'm gonna share with you the way that I do it, the sequence, I'm gonna share with you some cases. But most importantly, what I wanna tell you is that I would classify my patients in like two groups. The group of patients, one group will be the group of patients that are completely healthy, that they don't like their smile, but they just don't know why they don't like it. For me, these patients are the ideal candidate for vital bleaching because vital bleaching is very cost effective, is, uh, it's very economical for the patient, it's minimally invasive. There is no tooth reduction needed to improve the color and the beauty of their smile. But most importantly, it's extremely conservative. And if a patient doesn't really know what is it that they dislike about their smile, I always recommend starting with vital bleaching because most likely, I would say nine out of 10 times, you will see that they are now loving their smile and they will tell you, wow, I couldn't, I can't believe that just something so, uh, a simple treatment, uh, very affordable and uh, minimally invasive was able to make my smile look as good as it looks now. Now the second group of patients are the patients that we're gonna restore. And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. Maybe a patient that you're gonna do a single veneer, or maybe a couple of veneers, or maybe four veneers, or maybe a patient that you're gonna do a class four, composite direct restoration, or a, compos or a single composite veneer restoration. Well, for these patients, the reason why I like vital bleaching is because vital bleaching can really simplify these cases for you. If you increase the value, if you make teeth lighter, you're gonna, it's gonna make it a lot easier for you to select the final shade that you're gonna use to restore these teeth. So keep that in mind. If you increase the value of teeth, you are gonna have less reduction in your cases where you're gonna do porcelain veneers because there's not gonna be any need for you to thicken your ceramic to modify the underlying color of the tooth. So it's gonna help you be more conservative. Conservative is gonna help you maintain more enamel and on the at the same time, if you have more enamel, you're gonna get much better bond strength of your ceramic to the underlying tooth structure. And the same with the red composite. Again, it's gonna make it a lot easier for you to select your shade. You may just use a single shade because if you have a tooth that has a very uh, distinct color gradient and you bleach these teeth and now you increase their value, the color gradient is gonna be very little or probably disappear. So with a single shade, you most likely be able to restore this case. So keep those tips in mind because they're gonna be very useful at the time of selecting what patients you wanna you know, help out with a vital bleaching. In today's digital environment, personally in my office, we're not doing any impressions. Uh, so for any patient of mine that is gonna get uh, vital bleaching, we're gonna scan them. And you know, one of the benefits that I find uh, through scanning is that I have their scans and I'll save them in my, in my server or in my cloud forever. So if you know, tomorrow, God forbid, they fracture a tooth or they may have excessive wear or they may lose a tooth for any reason, I have a scan, I have a copy of what they have the day uh, that, that I'm scanning. So their, their, their initial clinical situation is gonna be safe for me without me having to store any you know, casts or any stone models anywhere in my office. So it, not only that it keeps everything nice and clean, but it allows me to access this information whenever needed. So it may seem uh, to some of you a little bit overkill of scanning and then having to print a model uh, to do a, a bleaching tray, but that's literally the way that I do it in my office. So I have a Medit i700 in my office and, uh, and I scan uh, my patients. Uh, if I'm gonna do both upper and lower jaws, I scan upper and lower jaws. And if I'm gonna do just one of the jaws, uh, I, I still probably scan the whole mouth for the patient, again, just to keep uh, uh, these files saved in my, in, in my cloud. Once I have uh, the, uh, that, the scans, one of the things that I like about Medit is that they have so many apps that are, that are very useful from a clinical standpoint. And one of the apps that I like the most is the model app, because literally once I have the scan, it just takes me two to three clicks to create an ideal model for me to print and then you know do my suck down, do my fabricate my tray uh, uh, on this 3D printed model. Very easy, a couple of clicks, and I'm ready to go. In regards to the fabrication of the bleaching trays, the bleaching trays that I fabricated and that I want you to, I want to share with you, uh, my technique are very very simple. Anyone in your office can actually fabricate this tray. The tray has no reservoirs 
and it's non scalable which means I don't have to add any resin to my model and I don't have to scale up the tray after I, I, I complete my suck down in the vacuum. All I have to do is grab my 3D printed model, put it in my, in my uh, vacuum, warm the tray up, you know, do the suck down, and then literally just grab a scissor and cut straight through every teeth that I'm gonna be, that is gonna be in, in that bleaching tray. Now, when I say straight, I want you to know that you have to be at least one millimeter above the gingival margin. So that's all you want to cover with the tray because you want to make it easy for the patient just in case they put too much material inside the tray. You want to make it easy for them to be able to clean that or wipe it with one of their fingers. But the reason why I don't use any reservoirs is because the only concentration of product that I'm going to use that I use in my office is 10% carbon my peroxide and 10% carbon my peroxide rarely creates any gingival irritation. If you decide for whatever reason to use a higher concentration, then you do have to scale up your trays and most likely you are going to have to use reservoirs. And again, just to keep it simple, no reservoirs because I'm using 10% carbon my peroxide, no scale on the trays because there's no risk of gingival inflammation. Is there any risk of hypersensitivity? I'm going to tell you in my 29 years of experience, very, very low risk. And if your patient does experience some tooth sensitivity, I always tell them to use any to, you know, any toothpaste out there in the market for, to, for hypersensitivity, like maybe Sensodyne, uh, but it's rare. My patients rarely have any tooth sensitivity. Now, if the sensitivity is too high and the patient is uncomfortable with it, I just tell them to stop one or two nights and then continue. But I do let them know from the beginning that the more consistent they are with the treatment, the better and the faster outcome they're gonna have. And I always get, it, I always get this question from you know, either dentists or even my patients. Can I use a higher concentration? Would it make the treatment faster? You know, it may, may, it may make it a little bit faster, but at the end of the day, the end result is gonna be exactly the same regardless of the concentration. The benefit of using 10% carbon my peroxide is that there's very little risk to none for hypersensitivity and tooth ir irritation. And, most, and the most important thing is that it's a lot easier for the patient. They're gonna use a lot less product. So they're gonna have these 1.2 millimeter syringe, milligram syringes are gonna last them a long, long time because there is no reservoir. So there's very little amount of, a, of a material that needs to be applied in the inside of the tray. So again, my advice, keep it simple, use a low, low concentration regardless of the case. All the cases are gonna end up being, uh, are gonna end up having a good result. I have yet to find a case that I've not been able to help with 10% carbon peroxide. As you all know, there's multiple bleaching products and different concentrations out there in the market. But just to simplify, we're gonna classify them in two groups, the carbon peroxide group and the hydrogen peroxide group. Now, personally, like I said before, I like using the lowest concentration of carbon peroxide. But I do want to talk a little bit about the higher concentrations because today you will find in the market all the way up to 35% carbon peroxide. Now, 35% carbon peroxide is a very high concentration. You're gonna definitely get gingival irritation and most likely some hypersensitivity. Would I recommend in any case to use a concentration that high? Honestly, I, I don't recommend it, but if you have a single dark tooth, which we will talk about that in a separate video, then maybe, it's, and it's a very dark tooth, then maybe you want to consider a high concentration like 35% hydrogen peroxide. But like I said before, 10% works for 99.5% of all cases, and all the ones that I'm going to share with you in this video, even the darker uh, uh, cases, uh, you're going to see that they're all going to be solved with 10% carbon peroxide. So what is the other benefit of 10% carbon peroxide or the carbon peroxide group? Carbon peroxide, when it, be, when it comes into contact with teeth, the molecule is gonna break down into two, into two separate molecules. And one of those molecules is gonna be urea. And why is urea so important? Because urea is the molecule within the carbon peroxide that is in charge of increasing the pH. As you all know, once you dispense the carbon peroxide inside the tray and you have the patient put it in their mouth, initially that pH is gonna become low. It's gonna be I would say lower than four. Now, 10 to 15 minutes later, once that urea kicks in and it starts breaking down and you have the urea 
available within the tray, that pH is gonna crank up and it's gonna go probably like around 6.5 to 7, which now reduces any possibilities of this to create any gingival irritation and to damage and to create any um, uh, changes in the topography of your enamel. You're not gonna have that benefit when you use hydrogen peroxide. So that's why I have found out there in the market some products that even though they contain hydrogen peroxide, they also have 3% carbamide peroxide so you can have the benefit of the urea. But the great majority of the hydrogen peroxide products out there in the market do not provide that carbamide peroxide uh, within their structure, which means that you're always gonna have a really high pH and many of them even have um, phosphoric acid that is there so that it can etch the enamel and help the hydrogen peroxide go through the enamel faster. Now when you think about this, that's a very aggressive way, in my mind at least, of trying to increase the value or bleaching any patient's teeth. So in my practice, hydrogen peroxide is completely out of the question. I only use 10% carbon by peroxide and I've rarely used a higher concentration of hydrogen peroxide, maybe 20 or 35% hydrogen uh, carbon by peroxide, I'm sorry. Just in those cases where I think that, when I know that I have a really, really dark tooth and that I feel that maybe if I use a little bit of higher concentration, I can gain some momentum and speed the process up a little bit for my patients. So in summary, 10% carbon my peroxide, I think you're gonna use 90% of the times. Do you, can you use a little bit of a higher concentration, maybe 50 to 20%? You can, maybe in those very selective cases, older patients that have a lot of dentin in that pulp chamber, so very low risk of hypersensitivity, but keep in mind that you're gonna have to scallop your tray and most likely you're gonna have to use a reservoir. When I'm done with my tray, I'm ready now to talk to my patient and kind of verbally and in a written form, give them the bleaching instructions. You can definitely train anyone in your staff to do this. Uh, I personally do it in my office. It just, you know, cause I take photos and I, I really want to be involved in the whole process of, of uh, uh, vital bleaching uh, with my patients because that gives them that added, uh, in my mind at least, it gives them that added um, support. And when they ask me, uh, you know, can I buy something over the counter and uh, accomplish or achieve the same results? I always tell them, well, when you buy something over the counter, you don't have a dentist with it. So that's the reason why I like to be involved and they feel like, okay, you know, he's really walking me through this process. So the day of, of, of delivery of the trays and the bleaching product, I sit down with them and I walk them through the instructions. And because I use, again, a very simple technique using 10% carbon peroxide, my bleaching instructions are basically, I show them the tray, I put the tray in their mouth and I show them how to put it in and how to remove it. Um, if I'm gonna, if, if I give them both bleaching trays, upper and lower, I normally tend to try to convince them to do one arch at a time, and that is gonna kind of help them visualize how much improvement and how quick they're improving comparing the upper teeth, if I, we start with the upper, with the lower teeth that haven't been treated. But you know, rarely I do get a patient that wants to wear both, tra both trays at the same time, and that's perfectly okay. I do let them know that if they decide to use both trays at the same time, they may have a little bit of TMJ discomfort if they have any uh, occlusal issues or if they have a history of TMJ uh, problems. So just keep that in mind. So I tell them, I show them how to dispense uh, the product within the tray. And it's important for them to understand that because the tray does not have any reservoirs, there's very little product that they need to apply into each tooth. And the other thing that I also let them know is that I want them to apply the bleaching gel closer to the incisal third of the inside of the tray. So incisal third of the buccal aspect of the, uh, of the tray. Now the reason why I tell them that is because once they put the tray in, this gel is gonna now disperse within the tray. And if they put the gel either on the middle third or even worse, on the cervical third, they're gonna get a lot of this gel just flowing out of the tray. So please make sure that you let them know that you want them to apply the gel, a very small amount, on the incisal third, and then it will disperse itself once the tray goes into their mouth. Now, I also let them know that when they start wearing this tray, 
normally they're gonna see the first couple of days, they'll see that their teeth are gonna become lighter in some areas and not as light in other areas. So they will see like their teeth have these little, like, um, like little dots, white spots everywhere. I let them know that that is normal that our goal is to allow this gel to be in contact with the enamel because once it goes through the enamel and it gets into the dentin, it's gonna diffuse within that enamel and dentin and it's gonna bleach the tooth uniformly. So it is normal at the beginning of treatment for them to find, to see these, these teeth that appear to have white spots everywhere because the bleaching initially is not uniform. So I tell them all this, I give them this explanation so that they understand what to expect. Uh, of course, I take the photos the day of delivery, the pre-op photos, and then those photos I will I, I will keep uh, in their file, and I will follow them up every 15 days. I normally follow them up once or twice throughout the treatment. I do take some photos of control because I want to document these cases, just because they help me, you know, just put some information on my social media platforms, or maybe even share with another patient that kind of has a similar case than the one that I'm treating today. So that's just the way that I do it in my practice. And you decide if you want to do it that way uh, or not. If you want to follow them up and if you want to take some photos, some follow-up photos of your patients. One more thing that I let them know is in regard to hypersensitivity. You know, they may expect, you know, they, they may experience some hypersensitivity. And normally what I, what I ask them to do, even if they don't have any hypersensitivity, I tell them, from day one, I want you to use a, a, you know, a, a toothpaste uh, that, that helps with hypersensitivity like Sensodyne. And I have them use this toothpaste from day one. That really uh, reduces the possibility of any hypersensitivity. Now, some patients don't listen to that recommendation and they just use their regular toothpaste and they may experience some hypersensitivity. So I let them know that they can also apply this, this same toothpaste within the tray and put it in their mouth for you know three to five minutes just so that the, the, that the, the, the actual ingredient within the toothpaste that helps with hypersensitivity kind of it, it will be in contact with their teeth. And I have found that to be extremely helpful for my patients. So I, I, I let them know that this is, a, this is something that they can do if they were to experience uh, any hypersensitivity throughout the treatment. So again, I give these instructions verbally and I also give it to them printed just in case they forget anything uh, uh, that I tell them. In regards to foods, I honestly just tell them, you know, stay away. My patients are more in the older population, so I just say, you know, just stay away from any any wine, any type of foods that have, you know, a lot of coloring into them while you're bleaching. But other, even, even if you can, coffee. But honestly, I also let them know that if they do it, it's not gonna be critical. It's not gonna, you know, prevent the teeth from getting lighter. Just something to keep in mind if they really want this to, you know, be a little bit faster. But other than that, they can continue with their life the way that they do every day. I don't want any interruptions and in any activities that they normally do because, again, I wanted to try to keep this treatment modality as simple and as easy as possible for them. In this part of the video, I'm gonna share with you two cases that I've done in my office. Now, these cases have both been treated with 10% carbon peroxide and they're all vital teeth. And I think that this is gonna, is gonna be a good example for you to see what you should expect as an outcome of any vital bleaching that you do in your office following these guidelines. Thanks for watching. If you have enjoyed this video, please make sure to subscribe to our channel. This way you're gonna get instant notifications every time we upload a new video.